Hello and welcome to The Last Standee, a board gaming podcast brought to you by three exciting countries across Europe. I'm your host Alessio and I'm joined here today by uh, Audrey. Hi everyone. And Cara. Hey. Uh, today we will uh, do the exact reverse of uh, Dungeon Crawl with uh, Keep the Heroes Out. We will uh, uh, watch the struggle of keeping peace among beautiful critters with dawn of peacemakers and then we will sail tiny oceans with tiny crews to get tiny loot with tiny epic pirates but before that let's get with the usual standee catch up it has been a while so it's probably we will have a lot of uh, topics to talk about so let's begin with Audrey. Have you received your uh, gambler's chess yet? Uh, yes! <laughs> <laughs> She's showing pictures. <laughs> yeah, I, I, with my camera activated, I can show that I have a box just near me. Uh, I have started sleeving it yesterday after building most of the miniatures from it. I still have uh, Atnas, the Gambler, and something like 5 to 10 narrative uh, skills to build. Um, I haven't opened the rulebook at all yet. Um, I'm waiting on Alexis to visit uh, in a few weekends so that we get started. He's been reading the rulebook, so that's some job being done on one other, <laughs> let's say, place. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm, I'm still wondering so far how I'm going to fit everything uh, in the box once sleeved, since I use Paladin sleeves, which are, if I remember correctly, 90 microns, so quite thick. Um, uh, uh, some f- few things like terrain uh, stuff go in the core box, uh, if I remember correctly. Um, and yeah, after that, there are some spaces which I have absolutely no idea how I can organize the thing. So I know I'm going to buy an insert uh, soon, probably the Xelazar one, since that's what I got for my core box and I like it. Um, but I'm not sure exactly yet. Um, other than that, uh, I haven't painted in a month. Now I've been playing and finishing Baldur's Gate 3 uh, with my husband as cop. Yeah, we, we were on a holiday uh, during the two first week of August and we came back and jumped on it right away and we finished it around September uh, 5th, 3rd something like that, uh, after 70 to 80 hours. So we didn't have the longest uh, game of all the guys, the people that played it. But we we, we had lots of fun as the ND 5th edition players. Um, yeah, we knew what we were going into. We knew how to build, how to use stuff. We understood the things. And I saw that in the Baldur's Gate free community, some people were not uh, D&D players and were a bit lost uh, but maybe the tutorials aren't I don't know and yeah painting nothing in a month now I'm getting ready to go to the scale model challenge in Eindhoven um, in mid-October um, where I will bring one model that I finished in spring and that's probably going to be all I'm going to bring yeah, I think that's it for me and you, Kara. What's new? Um, well, I haven't yet received my gambler's chest. Um, don't know anything about it. I assume it's somewhere, maybe. Um, and I, I'm actually... Uh, it's <laughs> I mean, KDM was so far away for me. And now with the gambler's chest arriving, I'm thinking, ah, am I giving it another try or not? And I mean, there was this um, not very successful try of playing a campaign with Audrey a while back. I think like one and a half years ago or so. And um, I haven't looked at KDM since. (laughs) Um, 
Um, yeah, uh, so I, I'm not sure what I'll do once the Gambus chest arrives. I'm, I'm really torn between just keeping it in seal and, I don't know, waiting or selling it. Or I, 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 <gasps> I, 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 I don't know what to do with it. Or if I actually give it a go and um, hope that it remedies the things I don't like about KDM. Um, but yeah, apart from that, I also started playing Baldur's Gate 3. Um, ah. Though I, I mean, at the beginning of summer break, I, I got it and I played it for like six hours and I haven't played it since. Oh. Um, I mean, it's quite interesting what you said about people that don't have this D&D background playing this game uh, because um, I mean there have been other games you know uh, Neverwinter Nights um, <laughs> the old Baldur's Gate games um, and uh, even Knights of the Old Republic and <laughs> Knights of the Old Republic 2 they all use the D20 system from D&D &D. and um, back when I was a youngling and uh, played um <clears throat> Knights of the Old Republic, uh, for the first time, I was totally lost. I did not understand why things happened and what different stats actually meant and whatnot. And then I got into D&D and I played it with friends for a while. And at some point I came back to the Knights of the Republic and I started again. I was like, oh, wait, that's exactly the same as D&D. <laughs> And suddenly yeah. I understood everything. So, um, yeah, I I've, guess it hasn't changed that these games are not good at explaining the the underlying systems to the players, which I guess to a degree isn't necessary for the video game. But, um, I mean, especially Battle's Gate 3, it, it really shows, you know, oh, you get plus two through this and uh, now we have this die roll. I can imagine people getting very confused. <laughs> actions and bonus actions. Just yeah. that I saw so many people being puzzled by that. Yeah. So yeah, um, the, f the reason why I stopped playing it, uh, or I haven't continued playing, is I'm, I'm somewhat of a completionist. And it led to me spending one day having a um, conversation with myself about the difference between video games and role play, tabletop role playing games. Um, the last thing I did in the game was I reached uh, this place pretty early on where there are a lot of people that I can talk to and as a completionist I have the need to talk to everyone. And the druid <laughs> grove, I guess. Yes, I, I'm not sure how much spoiler is okay. Um, but that's and, the first like, town. So yeah, and the, the, the thing is I was standing there and I have talked to, I don't know, five people and I looked around and I saw, oh my God, there are so many more. And then I realized, wait, and if I switch characters and talk to people, there are different conversations. And then when resting, I have to talk to all my companions to, you know, see and hear and read everything. To get and, all dialogue. And I, I was just overwhelmed and I thought, Realistically, like in, in if we played this as a group in a tabletop RPG, we wouldn't do that. Yeah? We would come to this grove and say, oh, yeah, you know, what's interesting here? And the uh, DM would say like two, three NPCs and, um, and, and that's it. And just, you know, the, there would be the notion there are more people around and we could, you know, spend time just, just listening what people are talking about in general without having to play out all of these conversations. And yeah, and that's kind of what completely <laughs> destroyed my motivation to play the game. Um, not sure how to handle that one either. So uh, we have Gambler's Chest, we have Baldur's Gate, which I'm not sure how to continue or start or, or handle. Um, what I kind of do know how to handle is I got a dog. Yay, the which... best board game ever. Yes. Um, no. What? No. We, we are not going to talk about my cat vomiting this morning. No. <laughs> just, just seconds uh, before recording. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Um, 
Um, yeah, so um, at the beginning of summer break, like uh, six uh, weeks ago now, I um, got a dog. It's a miniature poodle. Uh, occasionally, you, uh, my, my fellow podcasters can see her walking around behind me. Um, Unless she's too miniature and we can't see her. <laughs> um, yeah, people, it's, uh, yeah, miniature poodle, poodle and um, uh, she looks like a stuffed animal. Um, which is pretty cute, and I, I always joke that uh, when I, um, you know, um, dress up for Halloween or whatever, and I want to my dog to be dressed up as well, I just need to um, put a button on her on one of her ears. Um, yeah, <laughs> and it's stuffed. Yeah, yeah, you know, uh, I'm not sure how how well known Steif uh, plushies are outside of Germany. You know, Steif no is this, this is. Um, they're just well-known, high-quality plushies and um, Steif, it's, it's the name of the company and um, translated oh, yeah. would be stiff. And the, the characteristic um, of all their plushies is they have this button in their ear. Mm. And, um, so the idea was, uh, is, hey, I just, you know, put a button on her ear and say, hey, she's a Steif, Steif plushie. So, Which um, will work in Germany, so since yeah. you are in Germany, that's all good. <laughs> <laughs> good to know that I shouldn't do it outside of Germany because people would just be confused. Um, yes. <clears throat> so yeah, um, apart from that, uh, yeah, I've played not a lot of board games. In fact, only uh, the game I'm talking about today, uh, Dawn of Peacemakers and uh, Earthborn Rangers, which arrived. Uh, which we'll surely talk in maybe even the next uh, recording. Yeah, you bet. Um, which is definitely worth talking about, but um, because of reason I'll explain later, I decided Dawn of mm -hmm. Peacemakers today. Um, yeah, so uh, that's basically it. Doc keeps me busy um, with health issues, with uh, vomiting and peeing and what dogs do when things aren't right. Um, what about you, Alessio? Well, <laughs> I, I didn't receive my gambler's chess yet either. I'm Actu the lucky one! Woo! Yeah, actually, a lot of people are the lucky one. Uh, for sure, uh, I think I'll just have to wait the end of next week at uh, this point and just call support because that's probably what I'm going to do. I did... I was charged for shipping, I did not get any status update, I did not get uh, an email from uh, KDM team uh, telling me that order was shipping, I didn't get uh, an email from the distributor which should be DPD, uh, the fulfiller actually, and so on. So it's probably... I, I would just say that uh, if anyone in listening is wondering about that, the addresses being locked in backer kit is not an indicator of shipping process happening properly or not. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you usually get uh, at least a shipping label created uh, on a status update on backer kit when this happens, but there's not even that. Uh, the weird thing, and I, I check it, is, I'm reporting this because it's possibly useful to people. Uh, there are two kinds of people getting the gambler's chest here. Uh, in the last uh, KDU, uh, no, not the KDU, the Kickstarter update from Kingdom Death, there was a reminder from Team Death to uh, get everything set up on uh, Baker Kit. And there is a confirm link. If you get there, you usually, uh, if everything is set up, you usually get uh, uh, a message telling you your order is locked or something like that and so on. Myself and a few other people uh, which who are in my same condition are actually getting uh, a loop of confirmation where you get there, you, you are... Uh, you were already charged, you already confirmed your address, uh, everything uh, is positively confirmed. But when you click on that link, you get uh, again to the page, uh, to the confirmation page, you have to confirm again, then you go there again, and you get the uh, link to the confirmation page again, and so on. So I actually think 
that at least my situation is caused by Baker Kit actually having a crappy state. Uh, I, I kind of get, I kind of guess that there is something like uh, get all orders with the status of uh, locked, and my order cannot lock, so they don't get the order and they don't send it, or something like that. So whatever uh, you. Uh, at this point, just for speculative reasons, because if you get to the 15th of September, you should contact uh, Kingdom Death Support to get the item shipped directly, so that will probably be the solution. I'm not panicking at all. And uh, no one is panicking. That's it. At yeah, ju just to check what's happening. And that's it. From a board gaming side, well, uh, it helped a lot the fact that money isn't infinite, but uh, I have a lot <laughs> Is it of. Not? Yeah, uh, actually, uh, this summer I got the wonderful uh, uh, combination of having uh, like uh, forced vacation of uh, four or five weeks because I have a lot of accumulated uh, holidays uh, and. Uh, and I have to spend them because, of course, the company is not paying me for all of these days. Oh. And, uh, and uh, so I, I was on forced vacation a lot. And uh, I, I had money for go going to, to the seaside with the kids uh, just uh, two weeks of, the, of all of those. So I actually finished a lot of board games. Uh, I got Earthborn Rangers and I agree that we should talk about it. And is for a future episode, so let's not spoil anything. I got everything of Marvel Unmatched, and I, I'm kind of entertaining the thought of reviewing them because there's a lot of fun and there's a lot of cool characters to to see, so for Unmatched I fans, didn't hear Marvel what? Unmatched. Unmatched, uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. The, the, in the last year, I think, Restoration Games had the deal with Marvel. They put out four or five sets, maybe including Deadpool, which is not great. No. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I have the theory that Deadpool is not great in any game it appears. Although the character is cool, I, I have yet to see a convincing Deadpool yet. Okay. So, uh, we'll see when Marvel Champions is released, but uh, uh, not really that encouraging now. It's always high risk, high reward, because they don't know how to translate the powers. When someone gets there, probably the, it will be the best Marvel game out there. So, uh, anyway, I got those. I played a decent amount of Frost Heaven. Uh, I have to say, Frost Heaven is really uh, a new and improved Gloomhaven with whatever uh, it implies, because basically I liked more what I liked about original Gloomhaven, I liked less what I didn't like about original Gloomhaven, so it's a lot more. There are a lot of new systems to, di to digest, something for the better, something for the worse, and it's a lot of stuff. I, I have come to terms with Frost Heaven and the fact that <laughs> I will never, I think, buy it. And uh, I will actually, fair, with a very high likeliness, uh, I think I will buy the digital version when it comes out. Yeah. And probably same with my husband. And we should honestly sell our normal Gloom Heaven and just do the digital game. And that's but. actually a sensible opinion because my, my opinion after playing both of those is that Digital Chrome Heaven is far superior to the physical version. Anyway, and that's about Gloom Heaven. I got uh, my pledge for Too Many Bones Unbreakable and uh, mm, very fun. I liked it a lot. It's probably the best game from Chip Theory Games. And... Uh, it's refreshing to have a simple and easy campaign. The systems are all refined and owned. It's probably the best base version you get, the best standalone version you get. I didn't yet play it enough with the other version and expansion with Too Many Bones Original and Undertow mixing in stuff. So no opinions yet. I got also to play a bit more of The Wolves. Oh, I review it uh, in text and it still has the same problem. 
uh, basically uh, the wolves is a unique euro game with uh, a lot of stuff going on but it has a problem with higher player counts that's it and this was basically my summer a lot of games a lot of stuff there is a bit more that i will talk about in the future so not spoil anything and i think this wraps it up uh, we are now going with uh, the actual content of this episode with the reverse of a dungeon crawl which is uh, keep the heroes out and that's for me okay <laughs> So, uh, Keep the Heroes Out is a beautiful, cute board game by Brew Games, designed by Lewis Brew, who I guess built the company and the game just to kickstart the game. So, uh, it's a 2021 kickst 2022 Kickstarter fulfilling this year. And it's a small, beautiful game of tower defense, basically. Uh, this is reductive. Basically, in Keep the Heroes Out, you are the monsters populating, uh, inhabiting a dungeon, and you are trying to uh, save the loot, the treasures of the dungeons, from the heroes. So, basically, you get uh, the local heroes guild, who is sending, at the end of each turn, a few heroes swarming the, your dungeon, and uh, you, one to four players, have to cooperate uh, to keep the heroes out. Uh, the game is very simple. It uh, it actually is one of its most beautiful uh, upsides. It's the fact that the game uh, scales... Uh, okay, scale, uh, the, the scaling of the game is probably a subject of uh, discussion later, later, but the game scales perfectly in this case because you have a, sequ a sequence of turns which are one player plays, then you act a um, uh, hero's turn, then another player plays, and then you act another hero's turn, and so on. So, uh, one, two, three, or four games, in from the perspective of gameplay, it makes not a real difference. What happens is that you choose, you pick uh, one clan of monsters, you have nine clans to choose in the base game, there's a tenth uh, monster to choose from which is Cthulhu which is uh, <laughs> yeah which is going from uh, uh, which is going from Kickstarter actually and uh, the monster clans are mostly divided in uh, three categories there are crowd control monsters which are the, your attacker ones the ones who basically kill the heroes so you have the dragon which is one dragon for the entire dungeon you have the lizard folk you have the gnolls the best boys uh, the best men <laughs> out there so it's uh, not only keep the heroes out, it's do anything you need and you can to prevent yeah. the heroes from looting your dungeon. Yeah, exactly. And then you have the defenders, which are basically the monster which come in a lot of numbers because uh, to defend, to prevent um, a, a, a treasure from being looted, you need to have monsters there, basically. So uh, a lot of monsters means defending better. You have the slimes, which are the classic slimes. You cut them, they become two. Uh, you get the skeletons, uh, which have uh, uh, two beautiful mechanics. Of course, when you kill a hero, you can resurrect it as a skeleton, so you get a new miniature there. And uh, actually, a new meeple there. And uh, there is another beautiful... Uh, there, are, there is another beautiful interaction with, uh, with, let's say, the market of the game, which is the loot cards. Uh, in, the loot, uh, in the loot cards, you have a marketplace when you, get, you can get equipment, you can get beasts and stuff like that. Uh, since skeletons are made of bones, you have actually a way to make bones so you can get beasts easily. You can tame beasts easily in the dungeon. <laughs> uh, so uh, that's it. And there are the Ratkins, of course, uh, which just uh, flood the board with a lot of rats. Yeah, but there had to be either of the rats or the goblins. These are just classic. Yeah. You can't have at least one. You get rats, goblins, rats and goblins, but they are the floating mob type. Uh, and then there is support. 
Support is basically whatever you get to move easily in the dungeon, to get uh, easily uh, resources and craft stuff, or to basically uh, have presence on the table, basically. So uh, you have imps. Imps uh, have a lot of movement, so they can move around rooms a lot and they can carry around stuff, but we will talk about it. There are the poltergeists, the ghosts, where, uh, who are able to cross rooms uh, without corridors because they <laughs> go through rooms and uh, they can carry items with them. So they are very Sounds useful. handy. Yeah. And there, is, there are the witches, there are two, uh, who create portals. Portals are beautiful for the dragon, for instance. Uh, and uh, they can create portals and connect uh, uh, distant rooms from the dungeon. And each player takes one of these. Yeah, you get one clan, one monster clan, and uh, you play against the heroes. Now, uh, to, uh, to to give you basically a review of the entire uh, uh, gist of the game, it's basically you get a turn. So let's say I am the dragon or I am the, the Raskins and I take a turn. In my turn I have five I start with five cards in hand from my own deck and these cards are only made out of icons which have costs and uh, benefits I can pay to play these cards. I can play all the cards I want from my end and I perform what is there. I usually do that to uh, move around rooms, to kill heroes. Heroes have usually one wound, so you kill them uh, You kill them when you manage to attack. You have one activation, which is a special action you can do once in, a, in your turn. Uh, the activation is used basically to use your clan, your monster clan ability, uh, to add new miniatures, to make a ranged attack, to do stuff like that, or to activate the power in the room. For instance, if you are in the treasury, which is a special dungeon room, you have a special action to create a coin to make a resource in that, uh, in that room. Uh, after that, you basically play your cards, and when you are done, your turn ends. When your turn ends, uh, th there is a bit more to this, but we will tell, we will talk about that later. It's the turn of the heroes. Basically, uh, you first spawn heroes in. Uh, you you draw uh, a card from the guild, uh, uh, from the guild uh, deck, and you uh, do what it happens there. If it's a hero, you spawn heroes there. Then all the if a hero is spawned in a room with another hero, all other heroes are unexhausted because hero comes exhausted or unexhausted, and when it is unexhausted, it can act and is unexhausted and it is exhausted later. And when a hero is exhausted, it does nothing. Now, what happens is that you get heroes in a lot of the same places and. Uh, you usually spawn hero in spawn a hero, for instance, in a room with a treasure of the lowest level, or you spawn hero in the uh, dungeon of the dungeon, in the prisons of the dungeons. So uh, when the hero is played, it plays its special action. Then every hero on the board which is active attacks the monsters in its room. Monsters also have usually one wound, so they are usually uh, removed when they are attacked. And then all heroes in a room can try to, uh, can try to loot a chest. If the... What? <laughs> yeah, we are trying to forbid them <laughs> from looting, but actually if there are heroes and there are no monsters in a room, uh, the heroes can try to loot the chest. The chest has a level 1 to 4, and uh, if there are as many heroes as the level of the chest, they loot the chest. The chest is removed, and you are one step closer to losing. Uh, how do you win? If you endure two entire cycles of the deck of the heroes. The deck of the heroes is usually uh, 
8 to 12 cards. I didn't play all the scenarios yet, so actually because the game is reasonably difficult at some levels, and uh, when you cycle the deck twice, you get basically to the end of the game and you win. If the heroes get your only level 4 chest in the vault of the dungeon, you lose. So that's basically uh, the entire game. But the game is played a lot with interaction and special actions. Uh, there is one thing that I... There are two things which uh, make this game come alive, basically. And are... Uh, first, there is a pick-up and delivery minigame where you generate resources in one place and you bring those resources in another place uh, because you want to use the special action to craft stuff. For instance, with a bone you can claim a pet and the pet makes guard to the, to the room for you. So it's a kind of a special monster with special actions or a lot of wounds and makes a lot of stuff to the monsters. Or uh, you can build traps, you can get gear which makes you make more actions with a single card or without a card, and so on. So uh, moving stuff around to create things, open portals, uh, do stuff like that, is extremely important in this game, and it's a part of the puzzle. Each you, you, you get the game in 20 scenarios of, uh, uh, I think, growing, uh, escalating complexity. Uh, you get with a basic dungeon with no special rules, and you get to the end scenario when you have only two rooms, and you have to rebuild the dungeon, so add all the rooms before the game ends, while protecting the only two rooms you have, which will get flooded by heroes. So there is a lot of var variance in uh, scenarios, and uh, this is what the pickup and delivery aspect is uh, one of the beautiful things which fits perfectly. It, it, fit, it fits perfectly because when you move a meeple of a monster from one room to another, you get to carry one resource from one room to another. So uh, to do that, you basically have to generate resources and move them around, and when uh, there are two or three players at the table, you get, for instance, the poltergeist which creates a coin, then crosses a uh, room, we, uh, cross, go, goes across the wall to get the coin, where the dragon is. The dragon pulls an action which uh, makes you move uh, two rooms and do a ranged attack, and when it moves two rooms, uh, it, get, it carries the... the coin with you, then you get finally to the Gnoll, which uh, does the final action to crafting an equipment, getting it from the loot deck, and uh, going on. Uh, this kind of interaction is very beautiful because it's made out of very tiny pieces, which are on cards everywhere, and, uh, and they work out beautifully. The second very smart thing about this game is the asymmetry. Uh, this game is made out just... Uh, I, I would show, actually get to the Borg and Geek page and look at a few of the cards. You will see that there are only icons there which define uh, like... Uh, let me count them. I, I think they are 15 basic actions. That's all. You combine... Yeah, but it's not really a lot because one action is the boot icon, which is move one square. Another one is the finger icon, which is basically do your special action. There is a, a card with a plus sign, which is draw a card. So they are very basic, very uh, quick to learn. They are very understandable and they are combined beautifully. Uh, each clan can do something, and they can do that. Everything is expressed with uh, these icons, and you don't need anything else. You get the skeletons. You get the skeleton. Someone dies, and you get a new skeleton there. You, uh, your skeleton dies. You get a bone in that room. It's easy. They presented. It's very thematic, and every monster clan feels different. It's beautiful how they work, and. Uh, 
it's actually pretty smart because you have actions everywhere. You have action, special actions on room, you have special actions on your con card and in the cards you play. You have a push your look mechanism in this game, which is you have five cards, so a total basically of at most five actions in your turn, but you can push your look a bit and say, you flip, you, des you can decide to flip the next card in your turn of the guild, of the hero guild uh, deck. And uh, if it's a hero, you place it in the uh, prisons of the dungeon, exhausted. And if it's uh, an event, you discard it. And when you do that, you get to draw three more cards. So you get three more actions in your turn, you can do a lot more, and you will be compelled to do that a lot. What is the downside to this is the fact that you are adding heroes to the prison, and when you draw the wizard, the wizard frees everyone from the prison and activates them. So it's basically a pure mess. When you get the wizard, it's a dis you, when you get the wizard in the prison, it's a disaster. So that's you pushing your luck, most of the times it will do well, but it will spell disaster on your game when it will, uh, when it, you draw the wizard and you will draw the wizard. That's basically the entire game. I have a bit of downsides and a bit of upsides to list, I think I listed the, most of the upsides I have a couple more to say, but b before that I wanted to to hear from you, if you check the Kickstarter, if you had the chance to check uh, the game or something like that. Um, it, it was one of those Kickstarters, but I kind of, you know, uh, I, I circled around it, I, I, I wasn't sure, and in the end I think it was a fiscal decision not to back it. Um, but I've again and again wondered whether I missed out because I, yeah, I, I'm a sucker for cute meeples. And, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it, yeah, it sounds really fun. And I just saw they have announced, I'm not sure when, but there is a, a, a Next notification October, page. So very, very soon. Yeah. Uh, the a new Kickstarter, Keep Tears Out Boss Battles, um, with, as far as I understand it, I, I only just skimmed it, um, so some new expansion, and there's a unicorn, so <laughs> um, I think that's the uh, early bird reward also, uh, a unicorn monster meeple, <laughs> and it's just... Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, maybe I can find some. You are getting around. it. Yeah. Kara's <laughs> uh. a sucker for our unicorns. Yeah. <laughs> and meeple. So unicorn meeple. Well. No. Well. Uh, one thing I omitted is probably that the graphic choices of this game are beautiful and cute. Uh, the entire game is made out of cute illustrations with beautiful meeples. The meeples are printed, not screen printed, uh, but they are beautiful. They look cute monsters. I, I think it's a lot to say that uh, you get the slimes like the slimes from Dragon Quest from Akira Toriyama, so they are basically big drops of jelly. You get the rats which are uh, cute, very cute, so I think that's everything that needs to be said about the graphics. <laughs> anyway, basically, uh, 2023 was a weird year, because oh, we yeah. got uh, two cute games, two very cute games, we, which are Flamecraft, which we talked about yet already, and uh, Keep the Heroes Out, and contrarily to what one could think, they are also good games, okay? They are not perfect. But, uh, for instance, Keep the Heroes Out has one decent problem, which is kind of mitigated by the actual uh, manual, but you have to consider that this game is a bit uh, leaning on the hard side. Uh, and it's not really... Uh, I uh, said earlier uh, uh, that the game scaled well. That's actually kind of a lie. Because yes, it scales perfectly, because the turn structure allows you to have a perfect balance between uh, hero and monster turn. Uh, 
but uh, the problem is that you need you really need to have all clans represented uh, i think that this game is one to four players and it's true but you really need three or four players or at least three or four monster clans to have it uh, played at best because if you have only supports the heroes we will swarm you if you have only defenders the heroes we will swarm you again because uh, when you get to the second wave there are all heroes which are not killed around if you have only attackers you your dungeon will be looted completely uh, before you can react so um, really you need three monster cl clans to say the least it's uh, the, the solution uh, it's easy because you can tone down the difficulty you can choose there are 20 scenarios of increasing difficulty so you can choose the easiest ones uh, there are ways to make the game easier you draw less cards when it's uh, hero turns. Uh, you can uh, add a lot of stuff to balance difficulty but in the end you want to play this in three or two players to end it because uh, it really needs this kind of cooperation mm. uh, so the strong point the strong suit of this game is the cooperation but it's also its weakness it's really a solo game but as a solo player you you need at least to, to end the game to to get any real enjoyment uh, of that otherwise it's just uh, that's the defect of all tower defenses if you think about it which is basically they can quickly become just uh, the the sum of their mechanics instead of having fun uh, as a result of it it's true that when you get more players or more monster clans or both uh, the game shines so that's basically it i'll definitely keep an eye yeah. out for the new kickstart <laughs> yeah 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 uh, it's actually a recommendation another the last real nice thing i have to say about it is that if you play it at the lowest difficulty level the first couple of dungeons uh, since the game has actually no in-game text at all you can play with kids basically any age i played it with a five years old and managed to play it satisfactory not to a win but uh, we were happy to play we may we pulled out some great uh, combinations and it worked so it's a beautiful game to play together probably with a family and that's it keep the heroes out So, uh, if we are done with keeping the heroes out of our dungeon, we can actually keep enemies out of the battlefield with Dawn of the Peacemakers. Right, Kara? <laughs> yes! So, Dawn of Peacemakers. Um, first of all, disclaimer, it is out of print and the designer has said no, they will not reprint it. Yeah, um, it's not available in the Peacemakers uh, Kickstarter. Yes, um, currently, and I believe when this episode is released, it's still currently, because it's until the 23rd of September, if I'm not wrong, uh, there is a, a GameFound campaign running um, for Correct. the reiteration, basically, uh, called Peacemakers Horrors of War. Um, I'll get into that a little more later, but for now, Dawn of Peacemakers. It's a game that was on Kickstarter in 2017, was shipped in 2018 by uh, Sami Laxo. Sami Laxo. Sami Laxo. <laughs> yeah. Um, who we've talked about uh, in an earlier episode uh, when we talked about Lands of Galsia, um, the kind of uh, third game um, from him. The first one was Dale of Merchants. I'm just, I'm not listing the different Dale of Merchants. Um, <clears throat> then put on of Peacemakers, then Lands of Galsia, and now there's the project for Peacemakers, Horrors of War. So, Dawn of Peacemakers. It plays in the same world as all the other games, uh, Daimelia. And um, is chronologically the first one um, on the current uh, game campaign there is um, 
a timeline for the different games and basically Dawn of Peacemakers plays in the year 3329. Uh, Lands of Galsia plays in 4025, so about uh, 700 years later. And um, it's a very different game. Um, when you take a look at the setup game, it seems like some kind of skirmish area control kind of game but it isn't directly. Um, in this game, you play, uh, uh, each player controls one adventurer, hero, uh, whatever. Um, and these characters got recruited by a very wise and old advisor to some nation um, who sees trouble brewing. Yeah? Um, I won't go into detail with the story. It's something to explore if you play the game. Um, basically, two nations um, start drifting towards war and um, he sends these adventurers to try to, to quell these flames of war, um, try to cool both sides down and um, avoid greater conflict. Um, obviously, it doesn't really work, otherwise we wouldn't have a campaign with 12 scenarios. Um, <clears throat> if I just went there and talked everyone down, there would only be one scenario. Um, but yeah, so what you're doing is moving around the map, influencing these different armies while they just act on their own. So you don't have direct control over these armies. Um, but indirect. Um, each turn uh, is separated in an adventure phase and an army phase. During the adventure phase, the players act. Um, you have uh, different cards on your hand. Um, you start with four cards each scenario, um, which are divided between the players. So if you play solo, you have four cards. If you are two players, everyone has two cards. If you have three players, everyone has one card and the first player has a second card. And with four players, everyone has one card. On these cards are symbols for basic actions, moving, there are feet. The more feet, the more tiles, uh, the more spaces you can move uh, when you uh, play the card. Um, fortifying, you can place fortifications. So when a tile gets attacked, uh, the damage is reduced, which helps, you know, uh, make sure units don't die and um, the probably most important one is influence so when you are sharing a place with an with a unit you can look at their order decks so you can play cards with this uh, influence symbol and the more you play the more cards from the order deck you can reveal and put back in any order um, personally after playing four scenarios I decided hey it's nicer if I just flip them open, the ones I looked at, so I don't have to keep in mind what I actually saw. Um, <clears throat> and uh, that helps you knowing what the armies will do, uh, changing it a little like, oh, uh, they are attacking, so you know, I don't want them to die, so they I take cover now, so they have increased resistance, stuff like that. And, um, and then the cards have special abilities, um, so when you play a card, you can decide to use one of the symbols or a special or the special ability. There are, for example, cards that heal units, cards that damage units, um, cards that let you kind of drag a unit with you when you move, um, so you can reposition them. Um, cards to place additional fortifications, cards to change which units get activated, and um, so yeah, and. Basically, small things with which you can influence a battle. And um, yeah, then, um, as I said, there's a campaign with 12 scenarios. Um, it has a lot of unlockable content. So at the beginning, you have very few cards. You have these order decks, you have your uh, player cards, and um, I think four different unit cards. and. After each mission, sometimes during a mission, you um, open new decks, add additional cards in uh, different specialized units that get filled on the on the um, battlefield. Um, 
you unlock rewards and special missions during the scenarios and so on and so on. And um, yeah, you play through this campaign. Generally, the goal is to reduce morale or, or the motivation of both armies to a low point. Um, both armies start with a certain motivation. When a unit is killed, the army of this unit loses motivation. Um, there are also other things that can influence motivation. When one army reaches zero motivation, they flee the battlefield and the other par army has won. That's not what you want. Generally, you want both of these armies to be in the one or two motivation range, which means they kind of don't want to continue to fight, but um, they will defend themselves. So if both armies are at this point, they both just withdraw, withdraw from each other. So that's generally what you want to achieve. There are other victory conditions during certain scenarios. There are other loss conditions during scenarios. It's very varied. Um, with all this unlocking, it sounds like, okay, you have this campaign, you play it once, and then you uh, kind of, you know, kind of throw the game away, legacy game. No, it's all basically cards. Uh, there is a box in the um, game, box <laughs> with, uh, that gets opened at some point, um, and there is one big envelope, and everything can easily be reset. Um, every card that's unlocked um, is numbered, so you can, if you played through it and you want to reset it for another playthrough or you want to sell it, um, you can easily see, okay, which card went into which secret deck and just reset the game to its initial state and start completely anew. Of course, if you're playing it yourself again, you know what's going to happen. In some scenarios, there are events that happen after a certain number of rounds. If you know what it is, you can prepare for it. But um, I can still see myself playing it again, like with other players. I played it solo two-handed, um, which I would recommend if you play the game, because um, often you can only interact with armies if you share an air position with units of this army. So if you play true solo, you have to move around between the armies if you want to influence both. But if you play two-handed solo, you can move one adventurer to one army, the other to the other army, you are more flexible. Um, of course, you have to share the cards, which works in my opinion. Um, there is a skirmish mode. Um, I haven't tried it, I've looked at it. Um, basically, um, the, the skirmish booklet warns you, hey, you should play the campaign first if you don't want to spoil some mechanics. Um, it's uh, one versus one. There's one scenario for three players, and um, I think it's two versus one. And basically, in this um, skirmish mode, you take control of the army. So you have the order decks, you have a certain number of cards on your hands, and decide each round which order cards you want to play, so your army moves. Um, so basically, what happens at random during the normal play each player decides for their army then. Um, sounds fun, not really what I would buy the game for. Um, yeah, it's it's very different. Um, also, um, I bought the, the game secondhand recently and um, <clears throat> after um, opening it and, and starting playing it, I noticed that the guy I bought it from only played the first two scenarios. And it's a common theme in comments and um, opinions regarding this game that, oh, I played like two scenarios and it's kind of boring. Um, don't sell it after playing two scenarios. <laughs> Play at least the third one uh, because, yes, the first two scenarios are quite easy and not much is going on. Um, especially the first one is, you know, learn the rules. Um, and second one kind of, okay, now you learn the rules, now, you know, have some fun with them. And now third one, so now things can get dicey and you can uh, have more stuff happening. And um, yeah, 
uh, basically I read this comment that, hey, uh, we noticed the best play is to just do nothing and just draw cards because after each round the players draw collectively four cards again. There's no hand limit, so if you just do nothing you have more cards for the next round. And the designer commented on this and said, yes, sometimes it's actually correct that doing nothing is better because you have more resources for later and maybe at this point there's nothing you want to achieve. Um, and you just want to see how the battle pans out before you decide which side to help. And, um, and yes, in the first two scenarios, it might work to just stand in the middle and wait for five rounds and then have so many cards that you say, okay, now we just decide what, ha what happens for the next five rounds and um, <clears throat> basically beat, basically beat the, the game system. I mean, that's interesting because uh, so many games you feel like, yeah, you're losing actions, you're losing stuff if mm. you don't do things, or the game just forces you to, to do things. And very few have that option. I think that's very interesting. Yeah, it's um, it's it's kind of weird at first. Um, I actually didn't do nothing during the first two scenarios at any point. But um, in later scenarios, there's actually like this, okay, the board state is really complex right now. I have no idea what's going on. I don't know who like is has the advantage. So what's the best thing to do? I just wait, you know, let the armies do their thing. I have more cards and who knows, maybe something has changed. And um, yeah, as you said, it's really interesting. You aren't forced to act. It's not like you lose um, things by not acting and um, that's pretty cool. Um, also like the whole, for once I'm not controlling the army and my job is to kill the other party. But actually there are two armies that act and I'm trying to stop it. <laughs> um, which is, it's a nice change of pace. Yeah, also uh, that, that connects uh, both of the stuff, both of the things uh, beautifully. The fact that you have a win and losing goal and that it's just that. Because uh, the, the game set in uh, Demiria uh, are all uh, made out of cute meeples and uh, things. I think this game has miniatures, right? But peacemakers will have meeples, and uh, the fact is, the the the, the meeples, the creatures are really cute, but they are doing they are doing the most uh, the most lots of horrors uh, to to each other, and you trying to stop them is actually beautiful because uh, it not doing nothing uh, is. Uh, both mechanically and thematically very compelling because uh, uh, when a game I, I i'm i've always been of this opinion that when a game uh, poses you not doing something uh, versus doing something as a significant choice the game is better uh, the fact that you do or not do something as an impact of the game uh, is something of the most interesting design space out there and this game does it but the beautiful thing is that okay i i have uh, i have just to have them survive this next round i i don't i know that a lot will die in the next uh, conflict but uh, i only need to bring them to safety in the end so it's also a very beautiful thematic choice you, you, you feel the burden of making them kill this round because next round you maybe will be able to do something more important. Yeah. Um, also, um, as I said, 12 missions in the campaign and um, it's not like, oh, you need to play a scenario until you won and then it continues. No. Um, each scenario has win and loss conditions and they lead to different short narrative paragraphs, you know, oh, uh, how did this uh, resolve and what were the implications of uh, how it ended. Um, but then you still continue, no matter what you got, you still continue to the next scenario. And sometimes how the previous scenario or any, uh, some previous scenario ended influences the setup 
for later scenarios. For example, um, sometimes there are certain leader characters on the board, like army leaders, generals. They are named. If during a scenario one of them dies, he can't appear later on. So um, later on it says, oh, you know, if this uh, leader has died, you have to note it on a, a tracking sheet, um, don't place them and the army of this leader has two less motivation because, hey, they don't have a leader. And um, so stuff like that, or hey, uh, if you lost the last one, um, change uh, this in the setup or maybe they get an additional unit or whatever. So um, it's not like, ah, damn, I lost, I have to repeat. No, it's also not, ah, damn, I lost, now the campaign is fucked up. Though no, it's like, yeah, sure, there are things that have changed, um, but I still continue playing. And it also shows this, okay, yeah, we are trying to stop this war, but we are just a handful of people. Um, and in the end, what we are actually doing is trying to minimize losses in certain areas. Yeah, we can't be everywhere, uh, so other battles happen. And um, so it's kind of, it adds to this feeling of things are moving and we try to try our best to, to make it better. Um, and uh, something else, something else. Oh yeah, um, you also get at some point, this is like a minor spoiler for things you unlock, um, like individual task card or, 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 or challenge cards, however you want to call them. I forgot how they are called in the game. Um, so basically from then on in each scenario, you can decide, hey, do we want to do it cooperatively? Which means we get the cooperative uh, challenge, um, which is like, okay, you have your normal victory conditions, but also the special one, like, hey, uh, to actually win, you have to fulfill the victory condition and some additional things like, hey, this character is not allowed to have any damage at the end of the game, um, stuff like that. And, um, and then you get reward cards, which have a win or and loss side and give you some extra power for the next game. Yeah. So maybe, hey, if you won, you uh, can move one additional space when you're moving in the next game. Or, well, if you lost, then I guess you have to discard two cards at the start of the next game. Yeah. Um, so stuff like that. And there's also the non-cooperative version of that where every player gets their own card. Um, they still work together, but everyone also gets their own reward card if they fulfill their own objective. Um, and that might, I'm not sure if I would want to play with that because of course you're working together, you have to work together. And um, these cards might lead you to do something that's not helpful for the whole group. Um, but you still need to help the whole group so you can win um, because you have still to fulfill the victory condition of the scenario. So yeah, it's it's kind of, oh, I'm torn now between two things and mm. um, <clears throat> see for yourself if you like it or not. Try it, try it not. It's your game if you buy it. Always, um, <laughs> of course. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, as I said right now uh, on GameFound, the campaign for Peacemakers, Horrors of War, the um, <clears throat> chronological successor two years after Dawn of Peacemakers and um, also an iteration of the game. Um, there are a couple of changes. I'll just go over the biggest one because if you're interested in Dawn of Peacemakers, as I said, it's out of print. It won't be reprinted. Um, Peacemaker Source of War is basically the same game with first big difference, um, it doesn't have a campaign. Um, instead of these 12 scenarios that you play successively, um, it has six scenarios which can be played in any order. Um, so yeah, um, six scenarios sounds less than 12 scenarios. Um, sure, they said that, hey, uh, there is a lot of um, replayability for each scenario due to, um, I think also... You can combine any army. Yeah, and also there are um, 
different uh, challenges you can integrate and whatnot. So um, each scenario can be played multiple times with uh, different feelings and whatnot. Um, then it doesn't have miniatures, but meeples, which I actually prefer. <laughs> Uh, the miniatures are nice. I mean, they are cheap uh, PVC miniatures. Uh, they are cute-ish, but the meeples are more cute. <laughs> and um, yeah. a great improvement, a big downside of Dawn of Peacemakers is setup. Because you have this game board and the landscape on which the battlefield is happening um, is done with uh, tiles. So you start each scenario with searching for the right tiles, laying them out, and it's not like two, four tiles. No, you have to lay out 15 tiles or so uh, in a correct configuration, and it's just a hassle. Uh, Peacemaker's Horse of War has uh, basically map books, um, two uh, books, uh, spiral-bound map books. You lay next to each other, and you just open the page for the scenario, and the battlefield is ready. You have all the... Uh, information like which units are in it, uh, tracking uh, of uh, motivation, everything on there directly. You don't have to set this stuff up. Um, so that's yeah, it got it got uh, Joseph the Lionhead or S Sleeping Godson. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, and also there seem to be more factions included. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Eight factions. Oh yeah, yeah, right. Uh -huh. So yeah, um, more factions and um, the, um, which is also nice, the adventurers um, now are different. Um, in Dawn of Peacemakers, it doesn't really matter which adventurer you take. You get a, another letter of recruitment at the beginning to read, but uh, they all play the same. In Horrors of War, the special abilities on the cards might have some um, or, or a stronger effect if you play them with the correct adventure. Like, hey, uh, everyone can poison an army and inflict them two damage. But if this character does it, it doesn't do two damage, but three damage. So um, that's, um, I guess, interesting um, because it uh, leads to more like, hey, um, you can share cards with each other if you share a place and um, at least in, in Horrors of War, I believe, not in Dawn of Peacemakers, but there is a card that lets you share cards with other players. So uh, it's more like, okay, hey, um, I want you to do this stuff, so here I'm giving you this card, and so I guess it can really further cooperation. Um, yeah, and I think those are mostly the, um, the biggest differences. Um, all in all, a lot gets refined, uh, more streamlined, um, I still like Dawn of Peacemakers. I think it's sad they don't want to reprint it um, because I can imagine it having a place next to Horrors of War. But um, yeah, so for me, if you see this game somewhere secondhand, don't worry, it's easily, re easily resettable to the initial state um, as long as it's complete, of course. And um, so recommendation get it it's nice yeah uh, a bit of shopping advice maybe <clears throat> the kickstarter campaign uh, the actual game found campaign uh, gets you peacemaker horrors of war for 60 dollars for about 60 dollars or 60 euros maybe uh, because they are finished so it's euros and then it gets translated to dollars and uh, uh, you can get all the rest of Snowdale design games with a reasonable discount. For instance, you can get for 211 euros <coughs> all the games, including uh, Lands of Galzir and Dale of Merchants with all the expansions. Now, Dale of Merchants will probably deserve a discussion on its own because it's... Uh, <clears throat> both loved and dated by everyone uh, but Lands of Galtier is uh, basically worth the price so it's also a shopping and if you are the reselling type a reselling consideration uh, about that uh, since Cara mentioned uh, the secondary market 
you can also get Dawn of Peacemakers for about the same price on the Board Game Geek market. You can find at this very moment copies both in the US and in the European Union. If you are in other countries, it's probably a bit more difficult to get it. But there are copies on eBay too. So uh, there are options. That's it. I should point out that um, I just looked the, uh, I believe, the German um, person who's selling the Dawn of Peacemakers on Walking. <laughs> That's the one I bought it from. I don't think they uh, updated it. They have it anymore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, or maybe they had a second copy and selling it now. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, There's one copy less. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Um, and yeah, um, I believe um, when they had it in their online store, it was 70 euros for the game. So um, the prices on, on the Geek market Reasonable, are very yeah. reasonable. Um, yeah, you, you also have miniatures, so they cost a bit more anyway. And that's it. Let's complete this tiny epic uh, delve among three new board games with the tiny epic pirates, Audrey. Yes, Tiny Epic Pirates. Uh, so Tiny Epic Pirates is like most, if not all, Tiny Epic games in a tiny box. box. So you have a box which is filled to the brim with cute meeples. Here we have pirates, chests, and pirate head tokens. Uh, boats, pirate boats <laughs> with... Um, Oh, I don't know the it's name. It's all on video right now. Like the, yeah. <laughs> the sales. Um, a few more tokens. A little cannon as well. Tokens. Dice. Uh, other tokens. Then a, li a little set of small cards. And a set of bigger cards. And then uh, a bag. In which you get some more cute wooden blocks. With very cute colors. Like I, lo I love the purple ones. And a few coins, like four coins, which is not a lot. But anyway, so that's all in a tiny box. So um, you, you you feel that they have, you have a lot of value out of the component because these games are like 35 euros, uh, 40 euros. So they are not very expensive. And they all, yes, they all have the same footprint on the shelf. That's a generic thing about the Tiny Epic uh, series. Now, this is the Tiny Epic Pirates. So what are you going to do? Of course, not travel on the land. You're going to travel on the seas. These are the big cards so that you will put uh, to make a kind of map with islands and your pirates will navigate through these islands in order to loot merchant ships, uh, take their... Um, various goods that they are wanting to trade and also um, let's say fire cannons at the other pirates that you see so yeah i mean you are pirates so you loot merchants and you shoot fires i mean that's what pirates <laughs> pirates do um you have a few things so each pirate has their own uh, board It's a card, basically, with a steering wheel at the middle, because, yeah, you are captain of pirates, so you do have the steering wheel. And you will have some of the pirate meeples that are going to be your crew. So you are going to, over the game, assign them to various tasks. So the task of handling the sails. If you have more um, crew at the sails, you will move more squares, uh, more, tw more tiles, more maps, call it however you want, cards, at each time you do a movement action. If you put more crew at the cannon, you're going to be able to fire more shots when you fight with uh, either a merchant uh, vessel, because you have to fight them first if you want to loot them, or with another pirate uh, vessel. Um, Or you can also put uh, one uh, crew member to gold. If there are two sides, depending on the side of the board that you pick, you will have different the access to actions. A around the steering wheel, which is divided in six segments, you will have um, numbers, uh, of dice numbers, and also with actions. So you can you will have your pirate boss, which you are going to put on the steering wheel. And each turn, you will have to move him he or her, by the way, all cards uh, are, uh, have alternative between guys and girls, so you pick whatever you want. 
Um, and you will put your pirate, which is a change on natural my meeple, on the steering wheel. And each turn, you will have to move uh, your pirate leader on at least one segment. The way to determine that is depending on how many crew members you can find along the wheel. If on the segment after your um, your pirate uh, chief, you have one uh, crew member, you will not do this segment, but you will jump over to the next one. If there are two uh, crew members on the next two segments, you will jump over these two uh, segments and go to the following one. So these crew members on the steering wheel will let you basically pick your action that you do because each segment is associated with an action. So you move uh, your pirate leader to the next three segment basically and then you will do the corresponding action which can be moving which can be fighting um, stuff like that and when you do that that's a, a kind of way to plan your actions in advance because you will have to choose wisely where where to assign your crew do you assign your crew to pick a bit more your actions uh, do you assign your crew to do more damage uh, when you fight? Do you assign your crew to move uh, farther, etc., etc.? But something that is very interesting. And you reset your crew when you get back to the start of the wheel. So you still get them back after a while. And that is going to be very important because that's the basic cycle of, let's say, actions that you are going to do. And uh, each player will do that in turn. So when they are, when they see each other, they will fight. Uh, the loser of the fight gets a cannon token, which they can use for next fight. I think I think that's that. Um, so yeah, uh, you will uh, be able to fight the merchant ships. So that ca that can host up to three of the resource cubes on them. And then you can loot cubes. Uh, you have uh, a space on your board where you can store these cubes. And you are limited in... Um, oh, I'm, I'm saying very stupid things. Actually, the merchant ships are the small one. And they all have one cube. And on your pirate ship, you can host the f up to three cubes. That's it. So you will have to choose wisely because there is one of the cards uh, which does not constitute the map, but which is outside, which is the merchant, the market. And on the market, there is a value of the different goods. So you will put, um, there is a, a kind of ladder on the right side of the cards with values in coins. And you put your one cube of each color at the start. And they will rotate as the trades are made, and that will switch, let's say, the value of each um, resource over the game. So you may have to plan that maybe loading your boat uh, completely with, let's say, uh, alcohol. That's one of the resources, rum. Um, so completely loading your ship with alcohol may not be the best thing because even if it's high value right now, you know that there is someone else which has two alcohol who is going to trade it very soon. So you may be at a loss just afterwards. So there is that little bit of strategy. Uh, of course, you can fight merchant vessels and uh, other pirates only when you are on the same map tile. You cannot fight at a distance. And so there is a little bit of strategy of anticipating the movements of your opponents, uh, going there uh, to fight uh, and being ready to have one crew member assigned to the cannon so you deal more damage, etc. So, I mean, this box is tiny, but that's a game where you can plan lots of things, uh, honestly. And the thing is that from 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 my opinion on I've only played this game once but uh, you need to have players in a fighting mindset for this game I think because what we did was basically avoid each other go find treasures and uh, loot the merchant ships and sell and we did not see each other much and we were four players and it was very, it was a bit long because there was my husband, my two in-laws, and they had a little bit of trouble understanding the steering wheel mechanics. Um, 
And yeah, it was a very long game where we were all roaming around the sea but not encountering each other. And yeah, all of these actions that you can do, okay, trading the goods, okay, fighting will get you XP for your uh, pirate leaders. And you can at some point get some extra perks and actions. And we did not exactly get to that uh, because we were taking so long not not doing the actions that get us XP, basically. Um, so that was a bit of a frustrating game for all of us because they did not understand exactly what they had to do in the game and I did not want to be like, oh, I'm going to come on war to you because even if I'm more used, uh, let's say, to board game mechanics than them, I did not want to push um, the game on them. I did not want to be, let's say, mean to them. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, we ended up circling around on the sea for one hour and a half. Uh, we, when I, f I think the game says, um, blah, 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 fast game. Like, what is a tiny epic game? Easy to access. Uh, tactic, strategy, fast turns. This one I agree on. Uh, fast game, uh, great replayability. I do agree on that. A small box. And yeah, that's here they say 30 to 45 minutes for a game. Um, no, I'm, I'm sorry. And they say 40 years, uh, 14, sorry, years and plus for the gaming age. I do agree with this one. It's not uh, a game for kids, not at all, because there are so many parts. And yeah, I think that's a game for the group that you are used to seeing, that you are used to gaming with, and that have a bit of this fighting uh, mentality that here here we do not have. I mean, all you guys and uh, our listeners, you have, I think, heard me talk about games already to figure out that yeah, my thing is cooperative games mostly and all low interaction games um, and this one doesn't work in that uh, let's say philosophy. Mm. So I don't know if uh, you guys have played I don't remember another Tiny Epic game which might be different or just have encountered another game which seems to have like this kind of mechanics where you have lots of things that you can do but if you avoid one of these mechanics due to let's say the, the mood of the players around the table the game does not work yeah <clears throat> that's that, that's what uh, tiny epic games do actually uh, you you get a tiny box with uh, with an, an example of fully working uh, mechanic condensed uh, uh, very prettily actually I, I played the tiny epic dungeons and type, tiny epic, epic galaxies they are completely different games from each other and they are different from this but I, I can see from your description that there's a lot to 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 unpack here because uh, the, the, the rule book the rule book is 20 pages yeah exactly it's probably the biggest part of the box yeah and <laughs> uh, no but uh, i can see that there's an economy with uh, moving parts because uh, stuff uh, will get in larger supply and uh, will uh, get valued less there's an action selection a la patchwork where you basically move around the wheel and helm uh, steering wheel actually and uh, there's a symmetry in that uh, there you can place kind of worker which actually are not workers because they make you select action faster uh, there's uh, movement on the map there's a lot to digest and to unpack and that's actually what tiny epic games do best so uh, probably players of tiny epic games uh, series know this already but be warned, because these are not easy games. They, um, If we want to use weight on BGG for consideration, I think they are all in 2-3 range. But they, these are not easy games. Th these are easily movable games with everything you need in a specific genre. So uh, that's basically it, and that's what, what you are searching for when you are getting this game. Uh, when I heard you were preparing a Tiny Epic game, uh, I told myself, well, this is a chance to try Tiny Epic Pirates. I got it on Amazon, but it has not arrived yet, so that's uh, <laughs> a big loss for me. <laughs> I documented a bit, but I didn't play, so that's it. Um, I have <coughs> one question. 
Um, you showed all these components in the camera and yes. then showed the box. How difficult is it to pack it? <laughs> it doesn't shut completely tight, but like with a little bit of pressure, it doesn't okay. like, um, yeah. For but, no. Just cram everything in there. You yeah, can you, do that. <laughs> yeah, you still have to be quite good at Tetris, uh, to be honest. <laughs> but that's basically it. Yeah. So, yeah, for me, that's Tiny Epic Pirates. I don't think it's a bad game in any way, but uh, it's not a game for me. That one is for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, Tiny Epic Games. Uh, you just select the genre you want to play, you see, and that gives you an overlook of everything. I think there is a game called 13-minute uh, uh, games, uh, which is actually in Italian, which is 13 giochi minuti, uh, which is a uh, play on words of the fact that the games are very fast to play, so 13 minute games, uh, but they are ma minute mi by meaning that they are a simple showcase of a single mechanic. There is fun stuff too in those, so that's probably the, the, the category we are saying about, uh, we are talking about when we talk about Tiny Epic Games. And yeah, that's I'm, basically I, it. I'm thinking about in a slightly neighboring category because much, much, much less complex uh, of the five minute uh, dungeon, which actually does yeah. have that. Yeah, look, look, you, you kick out the strategy, and the bugs are generally like three or four times the size that would be necessary for <laughs> the components that are in the game. But for me, this um, five minute dungeon, even if it's again not something I like, but because of the chaos uh, that ends up happening. <laughs> Uh, which I did not expect to see outside of a uh, what's the name of that game with a totem that you have to grab when you have uh, cards with the same drawing um, jungle speed yeah jungle speed uh, that's the chaos that I expected to see at a jungle speed thing and not at a cooperative dungeon board game but this one uh, the five minutes thing for me fulfill more the let's say tiny epic parts of a game so uh, I, I, I was left a little bit confusing confused okay so this was tiny epic pirates uh, you got a lot of recommendations in the generals you got a lot of names dropped there so a bit to unpack and uh, i think that was all we have for today so uh, we have been uh, the last and you can get us on every uh, podcasting platform out there. We are on Spotify, we are on, on Amazon Music, we are on Audible, we are on Google Podcast, we are on Direct Download, you can get the RSS, you can get whatever you want. We are not that present on Twitter and Reddit uh, because of politics and <laughs> uh, you can get us at uh, http uh, slash slash uh, patreon.com forward slash the last and and uh, for today is a goodbye by Kara. Bye. Audrey. Bye bye. And myself. And remember, uh, the second E stands for epic. <laughs>